Hello. Welcome back to my channel Fiction Addiction. It's me again, Bearish Crimsh. Today, I am going to talk about HBO's miniseries, Chernobyl. Is those miniseries Chernobyl historically accurate? I really enjoyed the HBO miniseries on the Chernobyl disaster and overall, I felt that it was fairly historically and technically accurate again, fairly. However, the writers, the director, and all of the staff working on the project created an excellent piece of art in the form of this docudrama. I am also not the only one who feels this way. It is not too often that Hollywood tackles a story like this and invests this large a budget. You can really tell that they took great care and put forth a great effort to ensure that all the sets, equipment, clothing etc. was true to the Soviet era, in order to truly immerse you in the experience. In addition, I felt that the telling of the Chernobyl story as a vehicle to critique the Soviet system of government, human fallibility, and the importance of speaking truth to power was an interesting and fitting way to do it, and it was very well done. It also presented a very important aspect of the Chernobyl disaster, which is often lost in the cold calculus of post-disaster analysis, the human element. With all of that said, the show presented a number of historical and technical mistakes that I found a bit troubling and in one case very shocking. I realize that Hollywood sometimes likes to spice up a story to make it more engaging and to have a greater impact but as a scientist I feel I need to, at least in a little way, attempt to set the record straight. Especially given the gravity of the topic and the fact that one overriding theme throughout the show is how the suppression or the denial of the truth always leads to terrible outcomes. There is a lot which can be critiqued and I don't want to get too deep in the weeds so I would like to talk about a handful of technical problems I saw with the show. The more historical aspects I would like to leave out because there is still controversy over some of it, records are dicey, and even with publicly available information there is always the threat that mixed in with it are fabricated or altered records from the KGB. A proper historian would be best suited to critique those aspects of the show. Regardless, here are three of the biggest technical problems I saw from the miniseries. For the most part the show did a good job at presenting the radiation hazards that were present during the accident but there were a few big follies. There is a lot I can say about here but I would like to mention some of the bigger issues I saw. In the show, right after the explosion, it shows a spotlight-like beam of blue light being emitted from the reactor, racing up to the sky. There has been recorded accounts that this indeed happened but it should be stressed that this would not have persisted for days on end, nor would it have been as intense or as dramatic as it was depicted in the show. Furthermore, the biggest error made during this depiction was the source of the light. It was stated that the blue spotlight-like beam of light was caused by Chernkov radiation. It is virtually impossible to produce Chernkov radiation in air. Even if we assume that the air has 99.9% .9 humidity, any Chernkov radiation produced would be very little, hard to observe, and would probably not propagate too far away from the reactor. It is generally understood in the popular scientific literature on the Chernobyl accident that this blue light was caused by the ionization of the air produced by the ultra-intense radiation released immediately after the explosion to the show's credit this was mentioned later on. Regardless, it did not and would not have made such a dramatic light show. By all accounts it appeared to be a blue haze-like glow around the top of the reactor. A blue light was observed coming from Chernobyl but it was not this intense, did not reach this far up into the sky and was not caused by the Chernkov effect. The show also emphasized, repeatedly, how large areas around Chernobyl will be uninhabitable for 20,000 years. This is an over-dramatization. 
The spent fuel from the reactor will most certainly be radioactive for that period of time but the town of Pripyat and much of the area around the reactor is certainly much safer these days, and in fact, is now flourishing with vegetation and wildlife. Immediately after the initial explosion the whole area was unsafe but over the last 30 years most of the shorter half-life isotopes have decayed away and even much of the longer-lived contamination has been reduced. I don't have access to recent radiation surveys of Pripyat or Chernobyl but a survey from 2009 found that a day-long visit to Chernobyl would give a visitor the equivalent of 1 300th the dose of radiation you would get from a whole-body X-ray. This is also similar to the amount of radiation you would absorb on a transatlantic flight. For those of you who don't believe that the radiation around Chernobyl could have been reduced that much over time, just look at how the radiation level at ground zero of a nuclear weapons explosion changes over a 48-hour period. Finally, when it was shown that Lyudmila Ignatenko's child had died soon after birth due to radiation exposure, it was expressed that Lyudmila had survived because the baby had absorbed the radiation, which would have otherwise killed her. I will not argue that the child most likely died from damage caused by radiation exposure during fetal development, but the idea that the mother lived because the child absorbed the radiation is not scientifically sound. Radiation exposure and radiation poisoning doesn't work that way and while it makes for a tragic sound bite and a thought-provoking anecdote it is not based in reality. In that vein, it is also worth noting that studies which have been conducted since the Chernobyl accident to determine increases or changes to the long-term cancer risks to local populations, have come back largely inconclusive. In the short term, cancer rates did increase measurably and alarmingly but it has still been difficult to determine the long-term impact. One theme from these long-term studies has been that it has been very difficult to distinguish the effects of Chernobyl from other causes which can raise an individual's cancer risk. For instance, the fact that that the smoking rate of many Eastern European countries is very high has skewed results. Also, many parts of the former USSR are heavily contaminated from Cold War era industrial activities, in the form of heavy metal contamination, petrochemical by-products and other industrially sourced carcinogens. This more conventional contamination has helped to hide the effect of the Chernobyl accident on those populations. It also does not help that many of these contaminants also cause the same types of cancer and birth defects caused by radiation exposure. Former Soviet Union and Russia has consistency produced some of the best trained and most talented nuclear physicists and nuclear engineers in the world. There is no lack of talent in those fields. One plot line of the show was of Dr. Komyuk's efforts to determine what caused the reactor to explode. Through her dogged work, she determines that the reactor had a positive void coefficient and that the control rods were tipped with graphite in order to mitigate some mechanical consideration during insertion. Putting it bluntly, a lot of this is complete nonsense. The RBMK-1000 reactor was the pride and joy of the USSR nuclear community and everyone in that community would have known a great deal about the reactor its design advantages, and design weaknesses. Also, even if Dr. Komiak had no knowledge of the RBMK-1000, I am pretty sure all she would need is a detailed technical drawing of the reactor, a pen, a piece of paper and a calculator in order to determine that the design suffers from a rather large positive void coefficient. This is a straightforward nuclear engineering concept and it is not a secret that certain reactor types and designs suffer from this problem, people have known this since the 1940s. For those that are not too sure what a positive void coefficient is, it basically means that if the water in the reactor starts to boil the power of the reactor could increase. Not many and no modern nuclear reactors suffer from this but the RBMK-1000 did. The other key piece of information which was uncovered over the course of the show, and was found to be suppressed, was that the control rods were tipped with graphite. This is indeed true but it was done as a design modification to the reactor after its initial design lock and construction. 
It was not a dirty secret from its initial design. It should also be stressed that this is a major modification and affects every operation of the reactor. In particular, the movement of the control rods into the reactor would modulate the neutron flux inside of the reactor and would cause noticeable power fluctuations during insertion. Also, it is worth mentioning that this modification was not done because of negligence or cost effectiveness but to provide a better neutron configuration for the reactor when the control rods are in the top position, not necessarily a bad idea. None of this would be a secret. The operators, engineers, and scientists all would have had to have known at least a little bit about this major modification, and how it would affect the reactor. Whether they knew how dangerous it was to have all of the control rods outside of the reactor and to then slam them back in is something else altogether but the point is, it would not have been a secret that the control rods were tipped with graphite. In the second and third episode of the show divers are dispatched on a near-suicide mission to drain water from tanks directly below the reactor. This did happen in real life and the heroic actions of those divers did indeed prevent a second explosion but probably not the explosion you are thinking about. When Dr. Legasov and Dr. Komiak presented to the Soviet leadership the situation and the need to sacrifice three men, she mentioned that if the molten reactor contents impacted the water it would set off an explosion of approximately 2 to 4 megatons. When she said this my jaw dropped. Not because of the scale of the devastation which would be unleashed but because it was completely and totally wrong. There was no risk of an explosion of this size, and it is physically impossible for the reactor contents to explode in this way, it's the wrong types of materials, in the wrong concentration, in the wrong geometry, in the wrong circumstances. Also, please keep in mind that most nuclear weapons which are in current stockpiles are much less than 1 megaton in explosive power. To further put this into perspective, what the show is also implying is that all you need to do in order to create one of the biggest explosions in human history is to melt a bunch of low-grade reactor fuel and dump it into a pool of radioactive water. Yeah. If that was the case, everyone has been wasting their time on nuclear weapons development because this is a far simpler and more cost-effective solution to building weapons of mass destruction than spending billions of dollars developing complicated and notoriously difficult to produce weapons. The second explosion risk at Chernobyl was actually caused by the threat of a steam explosion. The threat being, the superheated and molten reactor fuel was going to burn through the remaining floors of the reactor building, reaching the contaminated water in the basement. Once it reached this water it would vaporize it and create a steam explosion. Probably not too dissimilar to the first explosion which blew apart the reactor. I am unsure of why the writers and director felt the need to exaggerate the threat so much. The actual threat was already pretty terrible an additional explosion which would have most certainly killed more people, thrown even more radioactive material into the environment further contaminating possibly thousands more land, and possibly caused the precariously positioned reactor lid to fall further, causing even more damage and release of radioactive contamination. Again, there was no need to make up an alarming and unrealistic scenario here. Regardless of the threat this does not and should not take away from the courage of the men who risked their lives by entering the stricken reactor building, which was highly contaminated with deadly radiation, in order to prevent the disaster from becoming even worse. The story of Chernobyl has many layers, and many lessons, which we should not forget. It has also set the tone for how the modern-day nuclear industry conducts itself and was the motivation behind the genesis of a number of international organizations, which promote safety and excellence in the nuclear industry. Finally, the story of Chernobyl is an inspirational story of the indelible perseverance and courage of the human spirit. 
With all of that said, there really wasn't a need to butter things up by getting some pretty big technical facts incorrect. Regardless, this was a great show and I am sure it will be remembered as a classic. So be it a classic that will always make someone who is knowledgeable about nuclear matters cringe a little, just like Hollywood should. Thank you for watching me. If you like the video, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe our channel, and hit the notification bell to support us. See you later.